So let's talk a little bit about the intersection of stress and memory. So I'm telling you this is a personal journey. Um, I think it's personal for all of us. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, what you see up here, though, is, is a book by a renowned neuroscientist um, by the name of, of Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who's at Stanford, and he's written a lot of books on the effect of stress on the body. And so just wanted to shout out, um, give him a shout out here. So we know that stress is in our lives. We hear it all the time, right? So, um, and you've also heard uh, through a number of sources that stress is, is adaptive, right? It's, it's something that we, we need. It helps us in some ways. It helps us to be, um, be vigilant, to have this um, arousal of our sympathetic nervous system. Um, and so that's a good. Um, the effect of some type of alarm is to activate our fight or flight response. And so that's going to involve the HPA axis. So we're gonna see the hypothalamus talking to the pituitary. Um, and by, what I mean talking to is it's gonna release, um, our hypothalamus releases CRF, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, and which activates the pituitary, which then releases this right here, ACTH. And then it's released in the bloodstream and it's gonna to go to the adrenal gland and um, cause the uh, production of a number of things, including cortisol, and activate these um, stress hormones that we already know about are these neurotransmitters, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So what we see with the stress response is that the body is going to produce a lot of these hormones and, and neuropeptides and, and et cetera, and it's going to increase blood flow and heart rate, and this is phagocytic um, activity, which I think is misspelled, but the idea of this has to do with our immune response too. So all these things are important to help us to resist the stressor. Now this is a better picture so you can see this. So you remember we've talked about how the hypothalamus can activate things in the pituitary and that there's kind of a distinction between these two, oxytocin and vasopressin, which are, are actually generated in the hypothalamus and released in a little blood system here in the pituitary gland and then out into the bloodstream. Um, so that's this area, that's the posterior pituitary. But if you get to the anterior pituitary, then what you see is a little different mechanism for that. Still starts with the hypothalamus, activates some of the neurons here in, or some of the cells in the pituitary, which then release different releasing factors. So these are pituitary hormones. This one's for the thyroid gland. This is ACTH, which is the one that goes to the adrenal glands or the adrenal cortex. This one's involved with um, cortisol. And then you see a, a few others that are involved with, these are sex hormones, growth. Um, here's prolactin. Um, and there's endorphins. So you can see there's a lot of things that this hypothalamic pituitary axis is involved with, and that's just to give you a kind of view of that. So the physiologic response to stress, what does our body do when it activates this HPA axis? Um, it can cause lots of differences, lots of changes to occur, and one of them is in the dendrites. So this says changes to dendritic arbors. So basically this is the branching that takes place on the neuron. Remember what dendrites are, they're these little uh, little outshoots that look like little little branches off of the, the cell body of a neuron, and this um, and what can happen in response to stress is something called down regulation. Now we've mentioned briefly up and down regulation, but basically down regulation is when receptors um, are kind of deactivated, sometimes even removed from the dendritic spines. And so that's something that can happen when this is there's constant stimulation. So if it's an acute response, meaning it's just like a 
one time shot or maybe just a couple of times, that just is going to activate the HPA axis. But it's the chronic stress that we worry about because it's chronic stress that's going to cause a lot of structural changes to the neurons in the hippocampus, in the prefrontal cortex, and also in the amygdala, which if you remember, this is sort of the, the is ground zero for a lot of the uh, emotions and particularly negative emotions, so fear, et cetera. So severe stress is going to cause a, a bunch of things. One of them is that it's going to cause the hippocampal neurons to get smaller or to atrophy. So some of those dendritic spines on the, on the hippocampal neurons start to sort of shrivel up. Um, and the other thing, though, the opposite effect can happen in the amygdala. So the amygdala becomes what's called hyperpotentiated. Remember we talk about long-term potentiation as, as sort of a strengthening of connections in an area of the brain? Well, this is hyperpotentiation, so that means that the amygdala becomes even more sensitive to whatever comes at it. So that can be a problem because it means it, it, you might think of it almost as being overreactive. So that's uh, something to consider. So the brain is really involved in, in lots of responses to stress, and this is kind of a, um, a very a well-known um, researcher by, by the name of McEwen, and he um, did uh, this kind of uh, concept that a lot of us think about when we're looking at stress and our response to stressors, and that is um, it refers to something called allostasis. So here's allostasis here, and here's adaption or adaptation. So when we look at this, we're trying to decide, well, what is the brain trying to do in response to something like stress to maintain its balance? In other words, to maintain homeostasis. Remember that from bio? So there's a lot of things which can be per perceived stressors. Things at home, environmental, neighborhood stressors. Sorry, there was a music interruption, so hopefully I'm kind of starting on the right um, area here. So I'll just go ahead and say this is a model, and it's a model of how our brain is responding to stress. And so we're, when we're looking at this, what we want to think about is, well, what kind of stress? So there's several things that can be major stressors um, that can do with our environment, which is sort of things pretty out of our control. Um, this also, trauma and abuse, certainly out of our control. Um, and then the other things that can affect our, our response to stress are things like our own individual differences. So our, you know, what did you get in terms of your genes? And our genetics can make a difference in how we respond. Um, certainly our, this is kind of that nature nurture thing. So if you're, um, some of your uh, upbringing can affect the way that you individually might respond. So these individual differences which occur. Um, over here, behavioral things which can influence our stress response, such as even our personal behavior like diet and exercise and sleep, all those things can affect how um, we, we respond and then what does our body do to try to maintain homeostasis? How do we take all of the, all of the processes that are adaptive and, and try to um, create uh, the best possible outcome for ourselves. So this is what our brain is trying to do in every stressful situation. And this is taking a look at what is, what is the allostatic load? In other words, what, what is the end result of all of these things in our ability to maintain homeostasis and hopefully ultimately adapt in the most positive way possible? Um, and this I just am showing you because I think it's, here's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So here's the HPA axis. So you can just kind of see in these, this brain slice here um, what we're talking about. So um, here's the hippocampus in relation to the hypothalamus. 
and then the hypothalamus talking to the pituitary, pituitary talking to the adrenal gland. Here we see the adrenal cortex, which is this part in here this, of the adrenal, um, sorry, this is the cortex. So cortex means bark, so it's kind of like the outer part. So there's an adrenal medulla and there's an adrenal cortex. Doesn't matter. At any rate, but they're going to release these things. Um, cortisol is one of many different types of things we call glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids. So that's that kind of a bigger umbrella term. And so when we look at those glucocorticoids and they go through the bloodstream, they can go into the brain. And when they do, then they can go to these areas that we talked about. So here's the hippocampus, where we say that they can cause a shrinking or atrophy of some of the neurons in the hippocampus. Um, here's the amygdala. And remember, in the amygdala, it can cause, which is kind of at the sort of the end of this, it's hard to see it here, that the amygdala is right in here. And it can actually cause that one to hyperpotentiate, meaning that it becomes more sensitive to what's going on. Okay, so this is some areas of interest. There's the pineal gland, you can kind of see where that is. And this whole area, this area in here, is all part of the limbic system. And so we, there, here's the cingulate gyrus. Remember, that's that area, kind of this big arc right here. So it's a lot of communication between this part of the brain and just about everything else. So um, there's thalamus. There's our hub. Mammillary bodies we haven't talked about, but we will. And yeah, so just wanted to show you that. All right, keep going. So this is actually from a study that looked at the structural effects in both the hippocampus and the amygdala when someone or something is uh, subjected to chronic stress, meaning like long-term stress. So on this one, what we're seeing is the effect on these neurons. So these are called apical den. Here's the apical dendrites of these neurons in an area called CA3 of the hippocampus. And what can happen in those, and, oh, and this is these are cells in the area we call the dentate gyrus. So it's an area where new neurons actually can be produced. And the effect of stress on that is uh, you can kind of see that this is, it looks like it's been sort of withering away a little bit here on this these dendrites. And, and right here, we just don't see much going on. So this is kind of this area, this neuron has been inhibited. So this is an inhibition of something we would call neurogenesis. That's the, the birth of new neurons in this part of the brain. In the amygdala, though, by contrast, look what happens. So this is dendritic hypertrophy, hypertrophy. So it's an, an increase in growth in the amygdala, making it much more sensitive. Now, when you get stressed, it's going to influence how it affects your memory. So stress in the early stages of memory, if you have a little bit of stress as you're trying to learn something, is actually pretty good at helping you to recall something, to recall events. So it can even enhance these new memories that are forming. So this is why in here it says cramming before a test works for a short amount of time. Um, but if it comes later in the process, or if, if there is chronic stress, you, you're going to have trouble with probably all of this acquiring new memories, and this is consolidating or sort of firming up those memories, and then ultimately being able to retrieve those memories. So I'll talk more about this coming up. High cortisol, we mentioned, has a, has a big effect on how we can, we can actually create new memories. Also can affect, uh, impact our sleep. And then finally, I'll get into this a little bit too. So this is kind of what I was saying before. When stress happens, it's going to have a different effect in terms of the timing or the ability to acquire new memories and kind of firm them up and to store them. So we'll talk about it hopefully soon. And I think that's pretty good. So we'll stop right there.